without further ado, begin our webinar. Uh, please uh, keep your microphones muted throughout and uh, submit questions to the chat, which we, will, which we will monitor and share with our presenters as we move to the webinar. Our webinar today was inspired by a recent book, Anti-Racism and UDL, and it was written by Andratisha Fitzgerald and published by CAST. Our presenters will share uh, their work uh, that has emerged from as a result of this inspiration. And I'm very pleased to present to you our uh, presenters for today, Tracy Galvin, Eric Moore, and Hillary Goldthwaite Fowles, who will discuss Mission Accomplish, Accomplice, uh, practicing uh, anti-racism with UDL as white allies for systemic change. And I'll turn it over to you, Tracy, first. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, we're delighted, and just make sure everyone else is muted. We're delighted uh, to be part of the Include, um, or to be the first people presenting in 2022. Um, so we have our Twitter feeds there. So uh, if you're, you know, somebody who uses Twitter and social media, please do reach out to us, um, tweet, and we have the hashtag include collaboratory as well. We're trying to make this as inclusive as possible and um, as engaging as possible. So please do use the chat. We'll have a bit of interaction uh, throughout a bit of discussion, but use the chat if you have um, questions or just want to post a comment or whatnot, uh, please do that. And we'll, we'll try and keep an eye on it. So I think, you know, the title of this is Mission Accomplice, Practicing Anti-Racism with UDL as White Allies for Systemic Change. Um, and we do have Andratisha in the room, so I'm so delighted. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us today um, and listening to our process, our um, journey that we've been on for the last 18 months and, and still very much um, on it. So if you just go to the slide, I think it's really important. The conversation that we're having, um, we need to position ourselves because we're very conscious that the three of us are um, white educators. So I'm going to just uh, go on to the next slide there around positionality. So we're going to talk about who we are, why we're here and um, how we actually got here. So before we each go into that, we're just, I suppose, we want to kind of state up front that we don't identify as experts in anti-racism. We are on a journey of becoming um, anti-racist and looking at anti-racism through a critical lens and the work that we do. So our backgrounds, you know, is in UDL um, and accessibility. So I just wanted to frame that first. So we're looking at it through the critical lens. So Hilary is going to just uh, introduce herself first. Hi, thank you everyone for being here today. And we're honored that you're here <clears throat> to have this important discussion about the intersectionality between anti-racism and universal design for learning and honoring Andratisha's book. So if you haven't read it, I really hope that you do. It really has transformed the work that we've done and how we're approaching everything. Um, our positionality as, as white people is really um, as unique as, you know, our, but we also acknowledge that as white people, we have the, the opportunity to be better and do better and not centering ourselves in this process. As Tracy said, we are not experts. Our pathways were different, but our goal is all the same. And that's to meaningfully contribute to deconstructing racism and education. And it's making way for more equitable and just learning opportunities for every learner. And again, our paths to get there have been different, but we came together in a really unique way. And we'll talk about that. I'm gonna share my path and then I'll turn it over to Eric who will share his and we'll turn it back to Tracy who will share hers. And my path started um, uniquely in my former school district in 2017 where a black educator was dismissed but had some horrifically racist things happen to her where students would go in with Confederate flags and record themselves and the teacher wasn't supported and I contributed to that. And getting over white guilt and white fragility, really looking at myself and looking at the system at large and saying, how can I actually be better and help make sure that this doesn't happen again to teachers and to people who are different than myself and understand lived experiences of different people. So I engaged in some personal work through the work of Leila Saad personally and in groups and then just sought 
to do, as Nicole Tucker Smith says, the parallel of the internal and the external work. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in our session today. I'll turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Hillary. Um, so it's not every day you go to a webinar where the, the leaders all say that we don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> you know, but, but it, it is very true that we're, we're not experts. And that's really a huge part of our work and our message here um, is, is that this is not something that we feel we will ever be experts in, that it's, it's a constant journey, it's a constant um, struggle, you know, to, to make good trouble in ourselves and then good trouble in our, our societies, our communities, our schools. You know, so for me, uh, I grew up mostly in a suburban, very white dominated type type school, both in terms of the population in the school and in terms of the way that the curriculum was colonized. Um, you know, we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but that was sort of the context that I grew up in. And as a social learning theorist, I believe that teachers teach the way they've been taught, not the way they've been taught to teach. You know, and so I, I went through a college program, teacher preparation program that really did emphasize um, being equitable, you know, and, and representing learner voices. And I believed in all of that. But when it came down to actually teaching in a classroom, I went back to, well, how did my English teachers teach? You know, what, what did my English teachers teach, right? And I just kind of sustained um, these systems that disenfranchised a lot of the actual learners that I had in a much uh, more diverse setting than the one that I grew up in. I feel like where I began here was from a place of, of genuine ignorance. I didn't know what I didn't know. And that wasn't necessarily my fault. But eventually, as I um, progressed to my career, moved into international schools, interacted with voices that were calling for change, my genuine ignorance faded into a willful ignorance, you know, and it was very difficult for me to want to change because I was comfortable with the status quo and the status quo had served me well to that point. And it took me some time, several years, really, for me to shift from that willful ignorance into a position of curiosity, of realizing that this was something that was actually important and that I actually had some responsibility as a teacher, as somebody who was going to be teaching teachers that I needed to take up that mantle. Um, so for me, it was a reckoning, a reckoning of myself, of the choices I had made and of the choices that I was going to make. And, and to me, it was an assuming of a recognition of the power that I had and how that put me in a position of responsibility for how I disseminated that power, for how I shared that with others and how I honored um, the learners in my presence and the teachers that were going forth into their careers. Thanks, Eric. And for me, just to finish up, I suppose, so as Hilary said, some of our paths overlap a lot and some are very unique and individual. And just like everybody else, everyone has their own context. We're going to talk about our, our journey, but you'll have a different journey if you decide to go down this path. Um, and the process will be different, very dependent on the context, the support you have, the systems that you're, you're um, you know, working in and whatnot. And for me, I suppose I come from a very white uh, background. I come from a working class background. I'm very proud of that. First to college, you know, I broke a number of um, barriers to get where I am today. But I suppose I didn't experience um, difference. I didn't, you know, in, I, I'm Irish. I grew up in a society where really uh, people emigrated rather than immigrated. Um, for work and whatnot. So, you know, it was, it's now much more multicultured, still faces significant racism um, for certain uh, communities and certain groups. Um, but just like, you know, Eric mentioned ar around our own privilege, while I would have, you know, in some cases seen inequalities, you know, in my own personal life, actually the privilege in this scenario is that we, you know, did never faced racism. So, you know, for many reasons, just simple things in life, like I was never followed around the shop. I was never not given something for some reason because of the color of my skin. And I never really thought about that kind of stuff um, when I was younger because the only time I saw a difference was really on the TV. 
um, or if I ever travel, if I ever travelled, and it wasn't until an, you know until I was went back to university as a mature student that I saw much more um, diversity and in terms of volunteering and my work and whatnot. But I think we all come from the same place, which is really nice, and we all um, strive for social justice. But we've done it in a narrow way, that, you know. So it's been certain groups of people that our focus has been on, and now this has widened because you know you can't say you strive for social justice if if you don't support the LGBTQ plus community, you can't say you you know strive for social justice if you don't um, support our, our black and people of color communities, you know our traveling communities and things like that. So we all come from the same um, place, and we found that safe space with one another really important as part of that journey. So there's a really this leads into a nice quote, and, and if um, I'm sure um, someone has posted the blog post there in the chat. Um, Bell Hooks, and of course she recently um, died, and actually probably some people are well aware of who Bell Hooks is. Um, she was really forward thinking and is very much, um, you know, was driven by the work of Paulo Freire. So this is a lovely quote, and we talk a lot about uh, in the blog post around empathy and care and love. Um, and I'm just going to read this out. Wakening to love can only happen as we let go of our obsession with power and domination. And we've been grappling with a lot of this um, over the last number of months around power, around privilege. And we'll go into that a little bit more later on. Thanks, Eric. So we're going to um, start out by kind of talking about our, our personal journeys and um, how that, you know, that began with looking inward and reframing our thinking and how that turned into forming um, communities of practice. And those communities of practice turned into uh, action and moving forward together and, and bring a systemic change in our spheres of influence. So our journey together, the three of us and several others, many of whom are actually here, and it's wonderful to see you, um, we got together around Andratisha's work, as I think many of you in here have, have experienced her work and the, the way that she explicitly framed the relationship between UDL and anti-racism in a way that was timely and important. Um, so for, for me and for a lot of us, um, who are who are here now? We came to that work from being people who were invested in UDL, not yet necessarily fully invested in anti-racism. I know some other people came to that work as invested in anti-racism and not yet in UDL, um, and that was really the power I think of her book and the way that it bridged those two communities and got us talking um, in ways that have been really influential ever since. Um, but so for for me, it meant. As I picked that book up, I realized pretty immediately that this was something that I was going to have to have in, in community and conversation in order to really bring it to, to its fullness. And so I actually posted on, on Twitter out to the world, would anybody like to read this with me? At the time, I didn't know that Tracy existed or Hillary existed, you know, or the many other people um, that ended up coming. And, you know, we, we began meeting on a weekly basis where we had gotten questions and we talked through these things, um, you know, made connections to our own practices. And what we found very quickly was that in these conversations, um, the, the barriers between us broke down so fast that within a matter of two, three weeks, it felt like we were able to really open up, like we were a community of friends, of colleagues, instead of the strangers that we were mere weeks before. Um, you know, and so that that's really a testament of the power of this work. And it also is, is the importance of, of needing to be vulnerable. You know, that's really, I think, what we found quickly is that that had to become a safe space, awkward as it might have been with strangers at first. Um, to be honest, to be transparent, to, to wrestle with really difficult concepts. You know, for a lot of us white folks, um, talking about white power and, and privilege, you know, and, and, and the idea that somehow that the curriculum and, and our learning experiences have favored us, you know, these are difficult things to wrestle with and to talk about um, and, and to come to terms with. And then as people who are teachers or, or te training teachers to teach, um, the implications are deep and wide, you know? And so that community formed, I think, because we were willing to be honest, because we were willing to be um, vulnerable with one another and we learned and grew quickly together. Um, a second COP kind of spun off of that, looking at equity by design by Mirko Chardon and Katie Novak. Um, you know, I wasn't part of that particular group, but they they also, you know, when, when 
more into exploring that connection of UDL and equity um, more broadly in that group. As we finished up the book, um, Anti-Racism and UDL, one of the very first questions that we asked is, is now what? You know, because there was this recognition that it was not going to be enough to read the book and say that was wonderful. And it really helped me think about this differently. If it didn't, in fact, translate into what we were doing, into the actual practices that we brought into our classrooms and lives as professionals and persons. Um, and so we, we actually brainstormed a list of several different SMART goals, you know, that we could do next for, for actionable type items. And we kind of formed different working groups around those. So for example, one working group um, has, has turned to the UDL guidelines. And we've been exploring what would these look like if we transformed them with more of an explicit lens of anti-racism and equity-mindedness. Um, and we've been working on that and, and have brought that work to cast to, to bring it forward as well. Uh, we have also seen this as a continual internal external work um, you know, we're, we're, we'll talk about that more in a moment here, but we've been learning more and more about how the internal work and the external work have to go together. Um, we've also been exploring in, in deeper ways, the intersectionality, recognizing um, in ourselves how, how we have different identities, you know, that are affecting the way that we're going about this work, and also recognizing that everybody else does too, all of our learners, our colleagues, and so forth, honoring and recognizing and, and developing our attention to the, the different backgrounds and experiences and whole selves that everybody is bringing to the work and to the learning experiences. That's right. And I put in the chat too for everybody. Last night, um, Kat had um, Bar Gentle Green led a UDL chat and actually talked about those points and talking about the intersectionality and also talking about anti ableism, anti racism anti-sexism and like just all of the antis and how there was a missed opportunity, but that we're working collectively to write that. And David Rose was part of that chat. So if you are on Twitter, I encourage you to check that thread and just see where that conversation led because it was very deep and very meaningful and connected very well to what we're talking about today. Part of the internal work, and I kind of liken it to this, it is like an onion and we all have variability of how many layers of those onions that we have. And so it is almost like a psychic onion peeling, if you will. And so many of us as white people have, we've been conditioned as well by systemic racism in our own formal education through the ways that that representation happens through our, our curriculum, our materials, our methods, our assessments, and you know the ways that they've centered those who look like us and that did not center anyone who was marginalized or any classmates of color. And I'm from Maine and I, you know, just like Tracy saw people who were black on TV and it wasn't until high school that I was face to face with a classmate of color. And I just like didn't know what to do because I was not conditioned to, how do I talk to people that are different from myself? Because even in education, we were all siloed. So people with similar ability were in the same room with me and I was with the same people and that's just so boring. And I had to really unpack that and spend a lot of time unlearning, for lack of a better term, that. And, and I liken it to an onion. And when you get to an onion, there are these layers that you peel and you peel and you peel until you get to the heart and the soul of it and what that really means. And just kind of looking at how we're taught and how addressing systemic racism, racism through this lens of peeling back those layers. And it's iterative, it's not just a one and done, we'll talk deeper about that later, but it's peeling those layers authentically and meaningfully. And I know I've mentioned earlier, Leila Saad's work, Me and White Supremacy, that was an Instagram challenge in 2017 and is now a book and also was a book out for kids. I really, if you have not engaged in some of the internal work, her prompts will really help you and challenge you to do that. And that's where that onion comes. I I'm doing it again. I, it's iterative because I, as I'm learning and unlearning and understanding how success, systemic racism seeps into our institutions and into our lives and how that creates barriers for real deep, meaningful, authentic connection with other people that are different from myself and from ourselves, it takes time and, and energy to integrate that, but it's necessary. And, you know, we feel very strongly that we all have 
the, we need to do this. We all need to do this in our own way so that we're peeling back those layers of unlearning because then it spills into our settings, into our curriculum, into our materials and our methods. Even if there are people that you might not have, a, in Maine, we don't have a very diverse population and my former school district did not. So when the question is asked of, well, why do we need to do this work? There are not a lot of black and brown or people who are different than us here. Well, that's why we should. That's exactly why we should. And ask yourself why we don't have diverse representation because maybe we're putting up barriers for that because there are fears and stereotypes that are present that we're not recognizing or acknowledging or rectifying. And that's part of that onion peeling there. Absolutely, Hillary. And, and something we were saying there, you know, about how people oftentimes see the, the need for decolonizing the curriculum and so forth as a service to our black and brown students, but it's also service to our white students. You know, like I feel like I missed out on so much, you know, because of the way that my curriculum was, was so narrow you know, in, in my, my learning experience, um, you know, and, and I think that it would have taken, it would not have taken me so long to understand that that was a problem if I had been, ex, you know, or, or to understand the, how important it is for us to invite and honor everyone to the table, had I already seen them at the table, had I already recognized the power of, of other voices um, in the curriculum growing up. And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit further. Like I was saying, you know, through my journey, how I went from a position of ignorance to one of curiosity to one of action. Um, Links, uh, Lawrence Brown in his book, The Black Butterfly, talks about how this, this work of anti-racism needs to begin with a reckoning. You know, like another way of saying that is like being able to, to critically assess where are where are the problems? Where are the barriers that have been erected? Whereas Hillary sometimes says, and I like uh, the things that make you go, hmm, right? right? Like, so as I began reflecting on, on my journey and so forth, I recognized, as I mentioned before, that in my K-12 education, there were very few black and brown authors represented in the curriculum that was taught to me. Like back in elementary school, you know, we, we read we read a lot, but the only black or brown authors I recall are Shel Silverstein, um, you know, that he was very popular and that was pretty much it. Um, it when it comes to high school, Langston Hughes, you know, his poetry appeared, especially during Black History Month, that kind of thing. But all of the novels, all of the plays, 100% were by white authors. You know, I really missed out on, on hearing more of that, that additional representation. In fact, it wasn't until college in a class that was dedicated to world literature that I was really exposed to, to literature from other, other voices, from, from people of different cultures and backgrounds and languages and races and so forth. You know, and, and it, you know, it's one of those moments like, oh my goodness, they actually have literary content coming out of India, you know, or Morocco, or, you know, like it just never even occurred to me because I'd never been exposed to it. Um, <clears throat> and that omission, as I previously mentioned, carried forward into my work as a, as a teacher, I became an unwitting perpetrator sustaining this racist colonized curriculum in practice and robbing my students of the opportunity to be exposed to the rich, diverse voices of the world. So we want to kind of explore this with you a little bit. We're going to invite you um, to a Slido. If you've not used Slido before, the easiest way is to use your smartphone um, and to scan that QR code. Alternatively, you can go to slido.com and enter the code 727-329. The question that we're asking here is we want to hear from you. Thinking back to the novels or other substantial works of literature that you read in secondary, that's to middle or high school, um, did you recall being assigned substantial literary works by Black authors, like novels or plays? You can kind of see the results coming in real time. So we're looking at roughly 94% um, or so of you had none or very few, <laughs> right? Like, that, so it wasn't just me, right? Oh. So this this was a pretty pretty significant omission um, that I, I have to wonder 
is that on purpose? You know, and, and like, so that's actually our next question here. For those who did not get, experience a significant amount of, of such literature, or for whom that representation was minimal, do you feel that that omission was limited or limitation was intentional? And a little bit more of a span here. As we were talking about it, you know, this, this question is interesting because on the one hand, we have the intentionality today. And on the other hand, we have the intentionality of when this curriculum was set, because there's sort of a, a continuum, like I mentioned, you know, like the, the, the books that I was teaching my learners were the same books that I had been taught, and most likely were the same books that my teachers had been taught, right? There's sort of this, if it's not broken, don't fix it sort of mentality, where again, teachers teach as they've been taught, not at the, how they've been taught to teach. And so, you know, if somewhere along the way, like in the US, maybe in the 1960s or something, it was decided this will be our literary canon, and they were very purposely omitting or, or highlighting some voices over others. And then there was never a sense of, okay, but we need to change this now, right? Um, then, then it just continues to go forward. So even if it's not intentional today, it was intentional at some point. And by not changing it, by being silent for this, we become agents of the continued silencing. And so talking about that, and the, the poll results are not surprising at all based on our, you know, our experiences and how we've been talking today, but yeah, you know, we want to talk about a difference between diversifying the curriculum and decolonizing the curriculum. And they do go hand in hand, but one's a little bit more impactful than the other. So I do want to acknowledge that in some in some cases, even the term anti-racism or the term decolonization causes a feeling of squeamishness. So if you're seeing these words or terms for the first time and you're noticing what is going on inside of your body. Does it make you feel squeamish? Does it make you feel afraid, unsure, uncertain? And all of those are okay. It's, uh, it's part of understanding why that makes you feel that way and unlearning and peeling that layer of that onion back as to how do I get to a point where it doesn't and I really understand what this actually means. So in terms of that, and I'll call Tracy in to, to support um, some of this as well, because she has a fantastic Padlet with resources to decolonize the curriculum. So, you know, d diversifying the curriculum, you have a variability of materials. There's representation in those materials across different groups and assessments, but you're not really looking at the broader implications of the institution. You're still centering whiteness in that institution, but maybe in those pockets, you've got, you know, this group or you're celebrating black history or whatever you've got some diversity in your library and it's it and while that is a good start to really decolonize the curriculum is to really uncenter whiteness to not be centered in whiteness and it's not the default which then helps to dismantle those institutional inequities that have ripple effects throughout history while we people might counter and say yes we've made progress and yes it, well yes but Yes, but because there are still systemic equalities that are existent today from the ripple effects from the past, from legislation that was passed to marginalize, and that's particular to the US. And I'm sure from a global perspective, there's gonna be some variability with that, but I'm coming at it from the US historical perspective where it was all white centric, it was all white male centric, and it was all rich white male centric. So how, and then bringing in those stories that really just kind of kept that going and perpetuating and thinking back to what Eric said, how do we look at our past to inform our present and our future, but learn meaningful lessons from it so that that reverberation does, we can stop that and get to a point to a goal where there is true justice, there is true equity. And that we'll talk about this a little bit later about honor and love where we're really looking at each other and seeing each other and understanding these lived experiences of people who are different. And it's not us by the default at all. So 
Tracy, I don't know if there's something you would like to add or contribute to this point. I don't want to. Yeah, so I, I have added um, in the Padlet uh, resource there. So for someone, you know, there's a lot of really good. It's it's very, I have to warn you, it's very UK based. Um, and, you know, a multitude of univer what universities have done, we'll say, in this area. Um, I do apologize if anyone's here and going to hear music in a minute. I am not in my usual space and I'm over a Jamaican bar. So it'll be Jamaican music, you know, to bring in a bit of culture here, but it will be loud in a second. They've just paused it. So it's there uh, if you want to delve deeper. I would say, you know, a lot of people, especially they feel safer to diversify the curriculum. So if that just means changing some text, adding in certain um, texts that have a wider representation, including images with a wider representation, including maybe case studies. So a lot of people tend to um, feel safe there. And, I, and you know, you really hit the nail in the head there, uh, Hillary, when you're talking about decolonizing, about decentering. Um, but of course, when you talk about decolonizing the curriculum, it puts the onus and the responsibility on an individual, which is usually the educator. And that really can't only happen in isolation because we have to decolonize uh, the institutions. And there is a really nice uh, YouTube video in there. And I believe Dina Baluigi, Baluigi is in the space. So thank you and you're welcome. She's done a really, it's very uh, institutional, our own institution based, but she really talks about the processes and the systems that need to change. Um, to decolonize the institution because those two really need to work hand in hand. If we have unequal systems and structures and processes and policies in place, it's very difficult for an individual educator to completely decolonize their curriculum in isolation. So I just kind of wanted to flag that. Um, thanks, Hilary. So the next, um, just moving forward, uh, and this slide, I suppose, is really around um, moving the conversation forward. So leaning into that discomfort. So we talked a lot about our inward, um, you know, movement that needs to happen, how we need to critically reflect on ourselves, how we need to be more informed and whatnot. Um, moving the conversation forward around community and uh, Eric will go into that a little bit about building those learning communities and communities of practice that have really been key to what um, we've been trying to do in this space and it's great to see some people here in the room. Um, it's often hard for us to even recognize the existing barriers that exist if we're privileged in certain ways. So, you know, always linking it back to UDL around seeing what are the barriers that exist in the room and in the space for our learners. And it's very different for every, um, and very unique for every individual. And it depends on our own backgrounds and context, what we have faced, what barriers we have, um, you know, experienced growing up and through adulthood and even basic things like in education, even just getting a promotion, trying to, see yourself and identify yourself as a designer of the curriculum because you know we don't really talk about it in the blog post but around the hidden curriculum and that's really key in this whole um, conversation as well uh, maybe it's our next blog post folks but you know around the hidden curriculum and again it comes back to that um, decentering and decolonizing and things like if, if that if that isn't thought about that hidden curriculum so you know we're, we're opening access to un, in universities but what are all the barriers that these people have to face just to have the same experience as everybody else so it is an uncomfortable sometimes we have to be comfortable with our own discomfort and this is really key um, in this conversation and you know besides critically thinking listening um, intentionally understanding and committing to be um, an ally and an accomplice um, and an advocate that's really uh, important as well and we just need to think about that I don't know Hilary if you want to mention you had talked before about um, Lawrence Brown there about uh, white lash if you want to come in on that uh, sure just thinking about too from the U.S. like talking about the kind of backlash that's happened or white lash for as Lawrence Brown calls it's and it's across history, you see that. Think about, in our experience, about black and brown voters and the work that, the phenomenal work Stacey Abrams has done in Georgia to get, you know, increased access to voters through in-mail. And now what's happening in Georgia? Now there's a bill that's coming out to close five out of the six polling centers that were open as a result of her work and also looking at limiting mail access. Th these things are the white lash that happens when there's progress that happens for black and brown and indigenous people, and it's wrong. 
it's like, why is this, why, why is this happening? And so for, for us, it just, we really want to investigate and explore that, but it happens. Lawrence talks about that in his, in his book. And it's really just, it happens a lot. And if you think about our past president, you know, we had Barack Obama as our first black president in the U S and the lash that's happened as a result of having that. It's like when the disempowered get more power, the ones that are in power are afraid. And there's this angry, ugly white lash that happens as a result of that. So it's, it's like the, the paradigm is shifting, but it's that pushback that happens. But then what happens is we have to be really mindful and aware of what's happening so that as allies and accomplices, we can support and amplify the work that's happening to keep the social justice initiatives moving forward. Like Eric had said earlier, progress is, is not just a place, it's systemic and it, and it needs to move forward. And I don't know if um, Eric, you wanna add anything to that, to that point. I mean, just, just a little bit like, you know, Sean was talking about it in, in, the, in the chat, the idea of, of what this looks like systemically. You know, we, I kind of feel that in, in my experience, both with UDL and with the anti-racism, we, we have to, you know, position ourselves as individuals to compute, uh, throw our weight behind the movement, you know, to, to be there, um, to, to, to push back, you know, and I, I think that as we come together in groups like the ones that, that we have formed here together, and when we form groups in our local contacts, there really is a strength in numbers, a sense that I get, you know, it's, it's too easy to get burned out and worn out pushing back against the system as an individual, and we really draw energy from community. So I, I really feel like that's what it is, and it's about the, this persistence, because there is going to be pushback. It's always has been and always will be two steps forward one and three quarter steps back <laughs> you know I mean, that's really what it what it looks like um that's the nature of, of the white lash that hillary and that um, brown talk about uh, and we have to anticipate that and 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 continue the work and really that has to happen in community no one individual has the strength and the fortitude to, to keep going by themselves in that but together we can um, and that's all of us have a role and a responsibility in that. And that recognizing that too is a big part of not centralizing, you know, seeing um, I'm, I'm a servant of this work, right? And, and I, will, I will cast my weight behind it um, alongside and in support of others as an ally and as an accomplice, which we'll talk more about momentarily. Thanks. And just, I suppose to, this is a, a quote, um, that's in the in the blog post and we just pulled it out and we shared the blog post with um, Andrew Tisha and we're delighted that she came in to the space and you know she specifically liked this one so we were like we're putting this in here um, and she also at the very end of our first um, book club Eric if you remember um, she came in actually and, and summarized and, and had a great conversation with us so we feel um, you know along with the wider group that we we collaborate with that Andrew Tisha always has a space there because you know we were really driven by the book and it guided us and we have gone you know wider and we're coming back in and then we go out and we you know internal external all the time so it's it's really important to um to to uh, to recognize and, and thank and Tisha for that so I'm going to read out um this that and because we keep coming back to privilege and we keep coming back to dismantling privilege and identifying our own privilege so privilege is the ability to opt out of caring while we can opt out that also positions us with the ability to opt in with the power afforded to us by that privilege opting in is an act of empathy and an act of love and we talk a lot about love in in the um in the blog post and it's really interesting love isn't new we'll say to education per se and paulo Freire exp explicitly calls it out and we, we we reference that and also bell hooks um has wrote you know specific books around around what does actual love mean and we think about love we think about it initially as a child so if you've grown up with that kind of um feeling of love from any type of um, an adult or family member or parent guardian um, and what that means. And it's very different for different people. And, you know, everyone has lovely kind of gestures and thoughts and you always have a good place and memory that you have. And it's that warm feeling. And you, we have that in education as well. So a lot of people who maybe have more of, um, 
you know, not the same type of um, scenario at a home life, they crave that in their school education and they really draw towards certain teachers. So there are learners from a very young age who look at this, you know, an array of adults and, and if they care about them and show empathy and show respect that they genuinely work harder and, you know, even if they're not, you know, have, have, don't have an opportunity to have a breakfast at home, they get themselves off, they go because the teacher will be disappointed. And that follows right through to higher ed. And we've had a lot of these conversations, Hilary and Eric, around what does love mean in higher education? Because it's a, it's a word that a lot of people would say, you know, people say, oh, well, that's early years, that's primary, that's teachers love teaching, they love their discipline, they love their subject. But, you know, in higher education, can our academics love learners and it's really a question that we, we kind of start to go into um, a lot in the blog post so I do recommend um, that you read it I just wanted to call because like love is really important like do you do your job are you an educator you know administrator whatever do you do because you love your job do you do it because you love discipline do you do it because you love learning do you do it because you love learners um, and for I, you know all three of us at one stage came from teacher education backgrounds um, and love of education love of learning uh, and we would all come from I come from that mindset that yes you have to love your learners but I do we grappled with this conversation a lot around what does that mean if you had a conversation with a leader like what where is the love in the leader because we talk that we call that out explicitly a more traditional type of leadership in terms of a structured approach um or serving serving your community and that's that's really important as well so this is just a nice quote for everyone And Eric, you're going to talk about building um, learning communities. Yeah. And so kind of this is becoming a theme of our, of our conversation, but it's really critical, I think, in, in, in our journey and what we've learned um, to again see that we can't do this work alone. Wherever we are, uh, wherever we're situated, I think it's, it's critical for us to be looking for those connections, those opportunities. As, you know, we talked about curriculum. A lot of the time, teachers don't necessarily have total control over the curriculum. Somebody had pointed out in there, you know, with budget cuts in the early 2000s, it was really what's on the shelves. That's what we're going to teach. You know, um, oftentimes uh, teachers or, or, or even in higher education, faculty sometimes are constrained by, uh, by higher administrators who dictate, this is what we're going to teach. This is what we can teach or not teach. There's a conversation kind of happening in the chat right now about here in the United States and various states. Um, there, as part of that white lash that we're seeing, we have a lot of legislatures that are that are saying you can't teach about critical race theory. And what does that even mean? Does that mean that we can't teach true history about you know how how certain groups were were treated or are treated in the United States? You know, like does, does it mean that we we have to limit? What, what material you know we represent that type of thing is, is really nebulous and it's, and I think that that confusion is intentional because the goal is just to maintain the status quo. Let's just not talk about these things. Um, and really when individual people are, are fighting back alone, we're seeing casualties. Kathleen talks about you know $500 bounties against teachers who talk about critical race theory. In Tennessee, there's been several articles in the last several weeks about teachers who have been fired during a massive teacher shortage because they dared to talk about critical race theory in some capacity. You know, it's not like they're they're teaching um, you know white fragility in their classrooms. It's that they're they're talking about. How, how the Columbus Day, like maybe we need to rethink Columbus Day in the United States, you know, or, or like to actually talk about some the complexity of his legacy, that type of thing is getting teachers fired um, is unbelievable to me. But what this all to me indicates is that if we're going to see systemic change, then we need to bind together. And this isn't just people within a certain, <clears throat> excuse me, area and the teacher in the school, like just teachers, but looking for opportunities to, to connect with people in different roles, you know? So connecting with support staff, um, bring, having explicit and, and honest conversations with the leadership, um, bringing in outside experts, forming communities of practice outside of your institution, really turning the focus on the systems and environments uh, and how we got to this place in, in the first place. Place. You know, we have to have these conversations that, that expand, that bring in as many people as we can to bring more voices to the table um, so that we can approach this 
from multiple different angles at the same time. That's, you know, was one of my big takeaways from Andra Tisha's book, you know, when she goes into looking at uh, the role of communities, the role of, of um, administrators, like all these different, different entities that must be involved because racism as a practice in our schools is not isolated to one facet, but permeates all of it. And opportunity to transform is also shared and must be shared. So Hillary Tracy, um, one of the, we've been kind of using this, this phrase accomplice a lot. And, and we've also, you know, I think a lot of folks here are familiar with this idea of, of being a white ally. Um, I wanted to just kind of take a moment here to, to dive into this a little bit. Um, is there a meaningful difference between what it means to be a white ally versus what it means to be a white accomplice? I think it's important as well, Eric, because we have a lot of people in the group, in our wider group here, I see, um, Michelle, and I can see whoever else is here, but, you know, I think we can open it up and we can ask people to use the chat, do you see a difference yourselves of what you think that might mean, or if you read the blog post, what did you get out from that? I'm going to mute myself because all I can hear is the background music. Yeah. Turn it up, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Again, as we said, we're not experts in this, but we would love to hear your perspective on what you think being a white ally and accomplice is. I see there's some proactivity than an ally, mm -hmm. level of action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like the consensus here is about the, this level of action. So maybe being an ally kind of has this connotation of, of, I support you. Like, I think your work is important. I value that and I've got your back, friend. Uh, whereas being an accomplice is, okay, what's your next step? <laughs> right, like that, that, that drive to like actually get involved and, and um, get your hands dirty, right? And doing, doing the work. Um, so that that's kind of resonates with what that what I've seen as well. I think it's a it's actually a pretty big step if we're going with with what you're all kind of saying there. Um, from from going from being somebody who intellectually and emotionally supports this work to being somebody who's actually doing the work. You know, for a lot of white folks, we, we've talked about this a, a couple times here, and it's worth. Re it's worth reiterating, there's a fear to getting involved in that, even when we believe in it, even when we think it's important. And overcoming that fear perhaps is the shift from being an ally to being an accomplice, right? Like there, there's a fear that I might say the wrong thing or, or a fear that, you know, am I really the one to do this, right? What is it, how do I, how do I support this work without centralizing myself? And those are important questions, right? But Ultimately, things don't change unless we get involved. And, and like we were saying before, the more people are involved, the more energy we have. It's important for us white folks to recognize that we do have power, you know, that we do have privilege, and that from that position of power and privilege, we can we can give it away. We, 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 can, we can support others, you know, and, 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 and use that to honor um, and invite others to the, um, to the table so that we can make change. Yeah, I think, oh, sorry. Yeah, I saw that, so you can call it out in a second. I think it's, you know, with being an ally, it's like if you wear a lanyard, you know, to support the LGBTQ plus community, or you wear a little badge, or you have something on your desk, you're saying you're an ally, but that's it. You know, you may not actually do anything further than that. You may not ever call anyone out, you, you know, so it stops, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a time where, yes, I support a certain group, that's it. But, you know, and, and we've read so much around this and what that means for us individually and collectively. And then it's, it's, it's I think a lot of people are calling out the action part in the, um, in the chat. And Hilary, you just mentioned there, Michelle, who's part of the wider group, yeah. um, kind of really flagged it there in terms of accomplice around actions are coordinated with black, brown, indigenous and other people of color 
uh, liberation movements to disrupt the status quo and challenge systems of oppression. So that's really nice um, quote there. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, that's a great delineation of that. And that actor, you know, that might be an initial, we think you're, you know, working, you know, to dismantle oppressive systems, but you're not really challenging the status quo. You might post a quote that resonates with you online, or you might maybe read a book, but you don't really put any action behind that, that step. And then being an ally is really operating in solidarity, just like Michelle had just but challenging and educating you know, yourselves and others and working in groups and then accomplices are really coordinating with black, brown and indigenous and other liberation groups to really disrupt that status quo and to challenge those systems and oppression in a way that they're, they're suggesting, not the way that we're centering ourselves in a way that is really like hand in hand, working together and listening to that perspective and taking that perspective and honoring it and using that perspective to dismantle those oppressive systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really well laid out. I really want to just briefly highlight that actor line because we haven't talked about that much. We, we do get into it in our blog and um, in a recent chapter that we published as well, but that performativity is perhaps one of the most dangerous barriers to white accomplicing today and, um, and, and to the anti-racist effort in general, where that, that performativity is, is essentially making it look like we did something important. And then there, see, we did it. What more do you want from us? You know, as opposed to seeing this as, as something that is going to be a perpetual journey. Again, that interior work and the exterior work in a pendulum swing, constant and ongoing. Um, you know, so lots of examples of this are out there um, and, and, you know, posturing on social media and so forth, like, look how great of an ally I am um, without actually doing the work in our local spheres of influence is extremely dangerous to this work. Um, and it's something that I have to constantly remind myself about and encourage everybody else who's involved in this work too, as well, to be looking at who is the beneficiary of my efforts. And if it's primarily me, I've made a misstep. You know, if it's primarily I'm, I'm making a change in my local sphere of influence, that's being an accomplice. And it's a good way to, to indicate which one we're contributing our time to. So we want to kind of wrap this um, this up by, by briefly making connections to UDL, um, because I know that was in our title. <laughs> um, but what really the question that we have here is what is the role of UDL in um, the anti in anti racist practice. So um, let me let me throw that out to the other other panelists, uh, because we are all people who are invest in both of these now. Um, Tracy, Hillary, what, what do you see as the interconnectedness? How does UDL complement or support anti-racism? Yeah, for me, coming back to the barriers again, um, like it's all about minimizing the barriers and maximizing the learning. So, you know, when you think, I think it's just the mindset of like, as an educator, what have you identified as barriers? Like what are, you know, you're the person who has that historical expertise of your groups that you've had of your discipline and what are this, the challenges that come up each term you know what are what what is continuously giving you the most admin work we'll say um and when you're thinking about those so even in your very you know down to the design when you're in, in, you're intentionally thinking about these and you're thinking like okay how can i widen this a little bit to think if i'm only ever thinking about um accommodations so if i'm thinking if i'm designing assessment and i'm think do you actually think well what is the barrier here what is going to cause somebody a, a challenge or an issue if i talk about a certain topic who who is going to maybe be sensitive to this topic um you know so it's coming back to the barriers. I think we really need to come back to the barriers and think about a true, more critical um, anti-racism lens and think about who's in the classroom. And I think, you know, we often get um, sometimes if you if you work in an institution that isn't hugely diverse or you go you teach in a school that isn't hugely diverse, you often hear people say, well, we just have one student or just that's different than everyone else. And actually, I mean, that's very, very important to do this even more if it's one student, then, you know, and it's the reverse, you can have 50, 50, depending on what you have. So for me, I always think about the barriers um, and you're thinking about it through the critical lens there and you're saying, who are you centering? Like, where is the power here? Where, you know, 
do the students design anything with you? Is there any co-designing going on there? Um, where is the voice? Um, so it's decentering your own power. And that's very difficult for a lot of educators to do, to think about, well, I'm the expert. I need to talk for an hour. I need to, you know, organize all the, the activities. I need to say what a group can and can't do. I need to say when the assessment is taking place, what type of assessment. So it's thinking about it with that lens and it's all about dismantling that power and centering the student there a lot more. That kind of stands out for me straight away. Right. And in particular too, looking how the complement that there, are, you know, in our work group, we focused on um, two checkpoints, you know, looking at fostering collaboration and community and reducing stereotype threats and distractions. Those have great potentials to intersect and interconnect with the work of anti-racism. They're not explicit yet, but those are great access points where you can really supplant and center the work of anti-racism through the lens of universal design for learning because you're proactively planning for that variability, but you're looking at the lens. The lenses can be variable. And I think that's something we're starting to learn as we're digging into this work and looking at how do they all work together to form this kind of, I always analogize it as a, as a tapestry. So how do these threats, how do these frameworks work interconnectedly to form Absolutely. this tapestry that the goal is, is to dismantle these systems and to really have true justice where people are seen, heard, valued, and honored above the mm -hmm. system. So like in that earlier graphic, that picture with the people, the people, the individuals are there and we're seeing that individuality and honoring that, but recognizing the broader interconnectedness of everyone through that community. And I just feel like they, they're interwoven together and, I think that you know the opportunity to dive deeper into that work is something that's exciting and is something that is necessary because it's not just a one-off and it's not just something that's in addition to, they have to be integrated and intersectionalized in some way. And I think that that's the work that's moving things forward. Yeah, just briefly, I wanna to respond to Elizabeth Dalton's question about you know misrepresentation or misidentification of uh, diverse students as disabled, you know, I think a lot of the opportunity that we have here bringing UDL into the anti-racist sphere is to be explicit about the anti, about racist type barriers, like recognize those barriers existing in the environment, um, you know, very intentionally. And then, so, so asking yourself that question, what barriers exist based on learner race culture, language, background, you know, focusing on those explicitly instead of making, you know, UDL does speak about every learner and all learners, and that's important, but sometimes we need to focus on this specific set of learners, which has been explicitly disenfranchised if we're going to recognize those barriers and shift them from being, there's something wrong with the learner, as Elizabeth is saying, to there's something wrong with the learning environment that has disenfranchised them to a point where they look like they're a mismatch. They are a mismatch, but it's not because of them, it's because of the way the system was designed. Yeah, just we have questions there that you can reflect because I'm sure the slides will be shared afterwards. So just to finish up, because I'm very conscious of time. So moving forward, uh, what next? So to lean in to actively and intentionally listen, learn, unlearn and respond. Um, the barriers are in the system and they affect everyone, uh, the processes, the structures, the policies. Um, so we have immediate you know, responsibility for what we can change immediately about being a change agent. So how does this affect learners, instructors and everyone? And, you know, the nice slide there around building learning communities. We all have a part to play, um, including our leadership, including our librarians, including our administrators. Um, it's not just as often an onus that the person who is delivering this is the educator, or the instructor. Um, they're a centerpiece for the face-to-face -face interaction, but it's all of the other interwoven needs to all work together to support um, our academics. Um, it's a journey, it's not a once-off, it's certainly not um, a performance. And I think we, we need to lean in and be comfortable with our discomfort. Um, we need to start our internal process, but also be thinking about what does that mean systemically as well? Um, and I just, I'm going to open it up to Eric and Hillary if you want to add in anything, just 
because I am just conscious that we're one minute over. So we do have our uh, Twitter feeds there. If you want to, um, I haven't had a chance to check Twitter as we were going through. I just a big thank you um, to everybody who has joined us today. I think we had about 85 at one stage. So really hope you got something out of this conversation. As we said, we're not experts. We are just here on a journey um, and be delighted to be on that journey with everyone else. Um, and hopefully, you know, once that book chapter is published, we'll, we'll share it and, um, the same with the blog post is there. Do you want to say anything, Hilary or Eric, just to finish up? I'm looking at our time and just wanting to be mindful of everybody's yeah. time. Just want to thank everyone for their attention, their thoughtfulness, um, their willingness to lean in, to listen and to support and amplify the work. So if you're looking for tools and resources, there's Padlet, there's Google, and definitely look at Andra Tisha's book, Equity and also Equity by Design and other works for black and brown activists support them honor them and let's do this work together from a place of empathy compassion and love so thank you everyone thank you so much to uh, all of our presenters uh, we greatly appreciate this very thoughtful and very timely conversation on anti-racism and uh, it gives us an awful lot to think about um, the materials from this webinar, uh, the recording will be posted to the Include website as well as the slides, and you can read their very thoughtful blog that's already posted there. So we want to thank everyone, and we hope that uh, you'll come to other events that we have in the future.